I've got to uh, apologize to people. I won't inhale. Uh, I may not be the right person to uh, act as Toastmaster here. A couple of years ago in Denver, I understand that Ed Bryant handed out the uh, awards on roller skates. Last year in Baltimore, Jack Chalker uh, handed out awards at a crab feast. Now, if that's the kind of thing you're going to expect from me, you're going to be disappointed. I'm uh, too old to roller skate, and I don't have... Uh, I don't have any intention of saying what you thought I was going to say. You liked that, didn't you? You devils, you. But it is marvelous to be here at this convention in Anaheim, just a few short blocks away from Disneyland. There are times this weekend when I thought I was in Disneyland. They tell me that uh, there are close to or over 8,000 people that have attended during the course of this weekend. Now, the only, pro the only problem is that it's hard to find anybody in a crowd like this. I know all my friends are here, but I haven't seen either of them yet. 8,000 attendees. I can't get over that. When I came to my first convention on the West Coast back in 1946, the Pacificon, we had a grand total of 150 people and A.E. Van Vogt. They didn't have any Hugos in 1946. They had a banquet. And the, big, uh, the biggest thing about the banquet was that uh, so few people could afford to attend but they only served one chicken. <laughs> of course, it was a kosher chicken. It had been run over by a rabbi. Uh, for dessert, they bought in a cake with 106 candles on it. It must have been Ackerman's birthday. <laughs> Before they lit the candles, they turned out all the lights. When the lights came on again, two things had happened. Uh, Wendy Ackerman slapped somebody's face, and my watch was gone. <laughs> now, science fiction has grown since those days. The fans who were on potties are now on pot. Authors used to write clean stories are now turning out pornography on their four-letter word processors. Some of that stuff is so awful, I wouldn't touch it with a Frederick Pohl. <laughs> Still, the world has made a lot of progress since then. We know that. Many of the visions of science fiction writers of the 1940s have become realities. In those days, television was just a dream. Today, it's a nightmare. <laughs> and in 1969, we were actually able to put men walking on the moon. If we had a little more money, we could give them cab fare. Think of all the progress we've made in perfecting modern inventions like nuclear waste, air pollution. Today, science is on the verge of solving nature's greatest mysteries, including the success of Boy George. <laughs> you know, only a few months ago, my doctor, my personal physician, succeeded in creating life in his laboratory with the cooperation of his nurse. Uh, <laughs> science fiction has made advances, too, in that time. When I started out in the field, we had about 50 writers and 1,000 readers. Today, we have 1,000 writers and 50 people who can still read. <laughs> Plus 200 million Star Trek fans. Now, uh, 
uh, back in those days, uh, was such a small group that all of us science fiction writers knew one another, we were close friends, we had no secrets. I knew Carl Edward Wagner before he had his sex operation and changed his name to Ursula K. Le Guin. Once upon a time, uh, most of the science fiction writers lived in New York. People like H.G. Wells, Jules Verne, Lester Del Rey. And all three of them came to a bad end. Wells and Verne are dead, and Del Rey became an editor. Now today, the majority of science fiction writers live right here in California. A few people from out of town are not aware of that. Let me give you a partial list of a few of them, which I wrote down. Fritz Leiber, Quinn Yarbrough, Terry Carr, A.E. Van Vogt, Theodore Sturgeon, Vonda McIntyre, Ross Rockland, Forrest Ackerman, David Gerald, Greg Bear, David Knight, Kate Wilhelm, Marion Zimmer Bradley, Julian May, Steve Goldman, B. Joe Trimble, Horace Gold, Larry Shaw, Kathleen Sky, Ellen Norris, Ellen Dean Foster, F.M. Busby, Robert Silverberg, Dorothy Fontana, C.L. Moore, Jack Vance, Elizabeth Lynn, Terry Pinkard, Charles Fritch, Martha Randall, Walt Liebscher, Jerry Soule, Charlie Brown, Norman Spinrad, Emil Fataya, Richard Geis, Frank Herbert, and Charles Manson. <laughs> then we have all the other sons. We have Nielsen, Franson, Matheson, Anderson, Grayson, Payson, Robertson and Robinson, Ellison, Etchison, Emerson, Edmondson, Davidson, Ferguson, Richardson, Wilkerson, Jackson, Wilson, Josephson, Nilsson, Thompson, Bronson, Bronson, Johnson, Benson, Jensen, and Jessica Manton Salvinson. And there are others who are not here tonight. Ray Bradbury is taking a cruise on the Queen Elizabeth, where he'll be a guest speaker. But don't worry, the boat is built to withstand any disaster, even if he reads his poems. And Robert Heinlein is also taking a cruise. And much as we miss him here, it, uh, maybe it's just as well. Most of you folks know that when Heinlein comes to a convention, he generally stays in his room. The only way you can get to see him is to donate a pint of blood. That's a big thing for him. He's very serious about getting fans to give blood. What he does with it, I don't know. He can't drink at all. <laughs> now me, uh, I don't give blood. I don't like blood, and so I've never met Heinlein. I came close once, though, at a convention where he was attending one morning. I woke up with a nosebleed. Of course, I didn't lose quite a pint of blood, so I just went down to his room, stood in the doorway, and waved. That's as close as I ever came to meeting Robert Heinlein. There's another rich and famous writer whose name I won't mention, who's not here tonight. He's uh, having a nose operation. Doctor is putting in two extra nostrils so he can snort 12 lines of coke at once. We have other writers on the West Coast. Richard Matheson, William Nolan, George Clayton Johnson, who did so much for the Twilight Zone. And William Rotzler, who did so much for the Erogenous Zone. You know, I learned about sex from looking at Rotzler illustrations. I learned about the problem of, of sex from looking at Rotzler. I don't really mean that. I think Rotzler is one of the greatest sex symbols since John Houseman. We have uh, Gregory Benford, who's a professor of physics at the University of Southern California. If you've read any of his books, you know he gives good physics. Then we have the writing team of uh, Larry Niven and Jerry Pornell. Science fiction's answer to Cheech and Chong.
We also have L. Ron Hubbard, but we can't find him. We have Harlan Ellison, but we're willing to listen to offers. I shouldn't say that. I miss Harlan very much. He's been a good friend for many years, and I expected to see him here and didn't. There were several times this weekend when I was tempted to run over to the dealer's room and buy one of those Harlan Ellison sex dolls. Maybe it's just as well I didn't, because one of the dealers told me they were sold out. Ellison had come around early in the week and bought them all for himself. Now that's kinky. Think about it. Anyway, enough of writers. I just told you about some of the good ones. If I told you about the bad ones, we'd be here all night. We're going to take a little break here now for a special presentation. It is my privilege to introduce Mr. Stanley Schmidt, the editor of Analog, who will present the John W. Campbell Award for the best new writer. The nominees for the John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer are Joseph H. Delaney, Lisa Goldstein, R.A. McAvoy, Warren Norwood, Joel Rosenberg, Sherry Tepper, and the ever popular Noah Ward. Got a knife? Oh, don't have to open the envelope. Well, open the envelope. We want to make sure it says the same thing. Oh, you want to see if they match, huh? All right, I've got a knife. This is cruel, isn't it? John W. Campbell Award for Best New Writer goes to R.A. McAvoy. Congratulations. This is the kind I get to keep? This is the one you get to keep. Do I see? If you like. <laughs> I'd like it. I can't see anybody. That's good. The last time I went to a Worldcon, I listened to John W. Campbell give a long and very funny speech, not a word of which I understood, because I'd never been to a convention of any sort before. I think John W. Campbell would not like much what I write. I spent about 12 years trying to write what I thought John W. Campbell would like, and it didn't work. I started to write what I liked instead, and I think that John W. Campbell would have liked that, at least. Uh, thank you all. I think the time has come to stop being serious and hand out the awards. As you all know, uh, our uh, trophies for the best annual achievements in the field are called Hugo's. And somewhere on the table back there, I must have the envelope. Is anybody sitting down there that would notice a few dirty, ripped-up envelopes with some awards in them? <laughs> they were still selecting when I was... Uh... Ah. They hid them. Oh, good, thank you. Hmm? Let's get the worst of it, yes. Um, <clears throat> Our trophies for the best awards are called Hugo's, in honor of the late editor, Hugo Gernsback, who almost single-handedly lifted science fiction out of the gutter and left Gordy Dixon lying there.
The Hugos, with their fancy rocket design, have been around for many years. You know, I won a Hugo once, but it was uh, so long ago it didn't have a rocket on it, just a streetcar. <laughs> Nominees for these awards are selected by the popular vote of convention mem membership. Unfortunately, as you know, only one person in each category can be declared a winner. But while you're applauding these winners, I do ask you not to forget the other nominees. Each and every one of them has done an outstanding job and deserves our highest praise. Our procedure tonight, like the members of the committee, will be simple. <laughs> and here's how it works. In each category, I will read the list of nominees and announce the winner. He or she will then come up here on the stage, accept the award, and say a few impromptu words, whatever they've rehearsed. <laughs> In this connection, I want to tell you that uh, four people will be helping in the ceremonies. Two will escort the winners to the platform. The other two will hand them their Hugos. And the four helpers are Bess Meacham, the senior editor of Tor Books. <laughs> Betsy Mitchell, the senior editor of Bain Books. Lou Aronica, the senior editor of Bantam Books. And Jim Frankel, publisher of Blue Jay Books. Isn't science wonderful? At last they found a use for editors and publishers. Now we get to the hard part. Reading the list of nominations, that's pretty easy. Announcing the winner, that's no sweat. Getting the winner on stage is no problem. But when I spoke to the committee, while this was still in the planning stage, about 12 minutes ago, <laughs> they told me that each nomination would be accompanied by a slide presentation. Two or three slides showing uh, pictures of the nominees and their work. And there is a little problem. I have not had an opportunity to see if the pictures match the names that I will read. I've not had an opportunity to see the slides. I've not had an opportunity to run through uh, them in a rehearsal. I have not had an opportunity to see if these envelopes naming the winners are attached to the proper category. I have no idea if the helpers will give the right Hugo to the right winners. On top of that, the slide projectionist is drunk. <laughs> I wish I were. Anyway, be prepared for a few mistakes. But uh, here we go. We will start out with a category of best fan artist. And the nominees are Brad Foster for artwork, Alexis Gilliland for artwork, Joanne Hunky Wood for artwork. William Rotzler for artwork. Stu Shipman for artwork. And no award. No. They didn't keep up with me or I didn't keep up with them, but uh, you get the general idea what it was supposed to be like. Now, let us see what happens. Number one here, it says uh, something about uh, 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 Michael Jackson. No, 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 that's the wrong envelope. Um, five nominees and one winner. Mm -hmm. Best fan artist, Alexis Gilliland. <laughs> Thank you. 
Chi, Alexis Gilliland for best novel. I got to thank y'all. Uh, there really is no such thing as too many Hugos, you know. And Jerry Purnell, to the contrary, they're great to have around the house. And I thank you. And, uh, well, you know, thank you two or three times if you like. <laughs> Richard E. Geis. Mike Dwyer. Arthur Halabati. I hope. Dave Langford. Teresa Nielsen Hayden. And no award. The best fan writer, Mike Glyer. I guess this is appropriate. The only other time I ever collected one of these was for Dick Guys 10 years ago. But thank you for giving me one of my own. It... <laughs> the best fanzine is the next category. And the candidates are Ansible, Dave Langford, editor, File 770. Mike Glyer, editor. Holier Than Thou, Marty and Robbie Cantor, editors. Izzard, Patrick and Teresa Nielsen Hayden, editors. The Filk Phenomenon. Paul J. Willett, editor. No award. And the winner is File 770, Mike Blair. Note the change of costume. <laughs> I didn't write an acceptance speech, but some friends of mine got me an acceptance shirt just in case. So, well, now that I've won a Hugo, I'd like to thank everybody. And Marty and Robbie should get to go to Australia next year. Patrick and Teresa should get to go to England next year. I don't know what the editors of the Folk Phenomenon want to do, but they should get to do that too. And thank you. <laughs> As an encore, Mr. Garner will accept his next award in drag. We come now to the best semi-prosine. And the candidates are Fantasy Review, Robert Collins, editor, Lacus or Lucas, uh, Charles N. Brown, editor. Science Fiction Chronicle. Andrew Porter, editor. Science Fiction Review. Richard E. Geis, editor. Whispers. Stuart David Schiff, editor. 
and no award. So far, no award hasn't been doing too well. Hmm. Best semi posing, Lucas Carlson Brown. Johnny, there you are. As many of you realize, Locus is not a magazine put out by one person. There is a staff, and uh, staff both past and present uh, deserve this as much as I do. Thank you very much. Best professional artist. And all candidates for their artwork, Val Lakey Lindon. Don Mates. <laughs> Rowena Morrow. <laughs> Barkley Shaw. <laughs> Michael Whelan. And the award. Best professional artist, Michael Whelan. Thank you. Ha! <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my heart's pounding. I had to let out some of the energy. Um, it's especially auspicious for me to be receiving this award here in California uh, because almost exactly 10 years ago this month, I uh, was busily throwing all my earthly possessions into the back of my Volkswagen to drive out to the East Coast and undertake my first DAW book cover. I'd like to take this... Uh, opportunity to ask Don and Elsie and Betsy Wilhelm and Peter Stample to stand up and publicly accept my thanks for a wonderful 10-year association, which I hope will continue. <laughs> Who are you? They gave me my first assignment, and they gave me the courage to find others, and for that I'll be uh, always thankful. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'd also like to thank my wonderful family and friends and uh, the Connecticut contingent of the uh, No Nonsense Double Negative Church of the Subgenius, and our sponsor and mascot, Sluggo, and uh, last but not least, by, uh, by a long stretch of the imagination, the fans who voted for me. Thank you, one and all. You made me a very happy man. Thank you. And now, best professional editor. Terry Carr. For Universe and Best of the Year. Edward L. Furman. For the magazine of fantasy and science fiction. David Hartwell. For Timescape Books.
Shauna McCarthy. For Isaac Asimov's Science Fiction Magazine. And Stanley Schmidt for Analog. No award. Best professional editor, Shauna McCarthy. told me I should be ready for this, but I'm not. <laughs> I have no acceptance speech. I have several that I thought of that I can't say. But I want to thank everybody who voted for me. And I want to thank Isaac Asimov for his unswerving support and loyalty. And I want to thank Sheila Williams, without whose help I could never put the magazine out. And last but not least, all the writers who are helping me make this the best magazine I can make it. Thanks very much. was handed an anonymous letter this afternoon. It is not signed, and unlike much of the fan mail that I receive, it's not even obscene. <laughs> but it says, and I quote, now ladies and gentlemen, an unprecedented event. For the first time in the history of the Hugo Awards, the ceremonies will be purposely interrupted for the occasion of a special presentation. This man's name beside me is Ellison, Harlan Ellison. I'm Bob Silverberg. And though, uh, though Harlan and I have done many a soft shoe routine up here for your amusement and entertainment, uh, this is a fairly solemn event tonight and we uh, intend to be serious. We're too often blinded by the light of the season's new star. The new name, the hot name, they command our attention. And we let slide our responsibility to those who've done the work in years past. Tonight, we will rectify one small measure of that oversight. He was a fan in the days when being a fan meant hiding the science fiction magazine inside a copy of the National Geographic. Back in the 40s, the 50s, he was one of the Futurians. He was a writer. Not many stories, but each one a polished entertainment. Many of us remember Simworthy's Circus, for example. He was, most importantly, an editor. And that's how most of us came to know him. And that's where he had the most impact. Because he wasn't just a hired hand who swam through the slush pile and filled the magazines with whatever he could find. He was an editor. And he taught a lot of us how to get a lot better at what we hungered to do. And when the money ran short at Infinity, or If, or Science Fiction Adventures, 
He went into his almost empty pockets, because they paid editors in packets of dried bird seed in those days. And he advanced that penny a word from what little he had. He was one of us, no adversary, no publisher's man. And he knew we couldn't wait to make the rent until the publisher came through. He bought my first story almost 30 years ago. He sat across from me in a cheap Chinese restaurant on Broadway, and he said, kid, you're a professional now. He paid me 40 bucks on the spot, and he didn't get reimbursed by the publisher for three months. He gave me my start. He bought Arthur C. Clarke's The Star and Damon Knight's Dio, my own recall to life. Important stories by Jack Vance and Algis Budras and Asimov and unknowns like Edward Wellen, who went on to solid careers. He brought Conan back into print at Lancer Books. Many of you out there are too young to know his name except his legend. But tonight he comes before you to catch the light of the star that many of us have become because he was there and because he cared. He was an important editor. However, briefly, we worked for him long ago. And this sort of night is the sort of night when it's important to slow the chariots and ask you all to join with those of us who love him to honor Larry, Larry T. T. Shaw. This is clearly a conspiracy because physically I can't make a long speech, the kind of speech these guys deserve right now. However, if I bought Harlem's first story, I'm planning to buy his last one one of these days. So just wait. Next time I'll make a speech. And in the meantime, thank you all very much. The plaque says the 42nd World Science Fiction Convention honors Larry T. Shaw, editor, critic, author, agent, fan. Throughout the many phases of his 50-year career, he has served science fiction with perception, sympathy, and an uncommon grace. Acknowledging the debt, September 2, 1984, Los Angeles. It's about time. There aren't one whole hell of a lot of editors in this field who put integrity ahead of their careers. Larry Shaw was one of them. I get to present a special award myself now that things have been um, interrupted. This one says, in celebration of his 50th anniversary, as a professional science fiction writer, with all our love, L.A. Con, 42nd Wall Con, to Robert Block.
And if you think keeping that a secret from the master's ceremony was easy, you're wrong. Thank you. This is the nicest ever thing that ever happened to me with all my clothes on. <laughs> no, no. Except for my tears. Please wait here just a moment. Maybe I do need them up. Oh, me. no. The committee has asked me to present to Jerry Purnell something unique, <laughs> although you must have suspected that it existed somewhere in time and space. It's one of those things, a Euclidean, sorry, Platonian ideal. <laughs> this is the Hugo Award that will get you through times of no money better than money will get you through times of no Hugo. <laughs> For it is made of solid chocolate. <laughs> now, don't go, don't go home without the base. There is a base. I dropped the damn thing. The base broke off. We will now proceed with the minor awards. <laughs> Best dramatic presentation. Brainstorm. <laughs> MGM. Return of the Jedi. Lucasfilm Limited and 20th Century Fox. The Right Stuff. <laughs> the Lad Company and Warner Brothers. Something Wicked This Way Comes. Disney, War Games. MGM, the winner, Return of the Jedi. <laughs> Accepting for Lucas Films will be Howard Kazantian. Howard, congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. I must thank George Lucas, who created the wonderful trilogy and brought us the three pictures. And uh, of course, Richard Marquin, the director who executed George Lucas's and Larry Kazin's magnificent writing abilities. And to my right and left hand people, Robert Watson, Jim Bloom, and to over 750 technicians and actors who put in months of love and labor. But most especially, I must thank you, the fans, who have supported us so warmly. Thank you. Our next category is the best nonfiction book. Dream Makers, Volume 2, edited by Charles Platt. Or written by Charles Platt, I beg your pardon. The Encyclopedia 
of Science Fiction and Fantasy, Volume 3. <laughs> Donald Tuck. The Fantastic Art of Rowena. Rena Morrill, The High Kings, Joy Chant, and Staying Alive, A Writer's Guide, by Norman Spinrad. And our winner is the Encyclopedia of Science Fiction and Fantasy, Volume 3, <laughs> and accepting for Donald Tuck, George Price. Thank you. Well, when Don asked me to accept for him if he won, I wrote back telling him that while I thought we deserved to win, the encyclopedia was not the sort of thing that usually did win. I was wrong, and am I glad? And now, the best short story. The candidates are The Geometry of Narrative, by Hilbert Schenk, The Peacemaker, by Gardner de Zoy. Servant of the People, by Frederick Pohl. Speech Sounds, by Octavia E. Butler. and Wong's Lost and Found Emporium by William F. Wu. And the winner is Speech Sounds, Octavia e. Butler. Thank you very much. I, I had taken this um, nominee ribbon off earlier today for fear of not winning and having everyone know. <laughs> I'm glad I put it back on. Uh, I want to thank uh, Shauna, who bought my first magazine short story. I've done others, but they weren't put in magazines and anthologies instead. And I want to thank the Rapid Transit District of Los Angeles that uh, inspired Speech Sounds with uh, terrible service and fights on buses. <laughs> Thank you very much. We come now to the best novelette. The first candidate is Black Air by Kim Stanley Robinson. Blood Music by Greg Bear. <laughs> the Monkey Treatment by George R. R. Martin. <laughs> the 
the Sidon in the mirror. by Connie Willis. Slow Birds by Ian Watson. And our winner, Blood Music, Greg Bear. I've been saying all day that uh, lightning can't strike twice. I'm very wrong. There are people I'd very much like to thank. I'd like to thank David Brennan and John Carr, who first read the story. I'd like to stan thank Stanley Schmidt, who made me patent the idea and then bought the story, researched it to the extent that I had to patent it. I want to thank Beth Meacham, who read the short story and bought the novel a year before it was written. And I'd like to thank Astrid, who's been putting up with me. And I'd like to thank all the people out there who voted for me. I am having the time of my life. <laughs> thank you. And now, best novella. The nominations are Cascade Point. by Timothy Zahn. Hard Fought by Greg Bear. Hurricane Claude. Hilbert Schenck. In the Face of My Enemy by Joseph H. Delaney. And Seeking by David Palmer. And our winner is Cascade Point, Timothy Zahn. This is a complete and total surprise. The uh, short fiction panel today assured me I wouldn't win. <laughs> uh, I'd like to thank a couple of people, Stanley Schmidt, who bought this story, my first story, and many in between. I'd like to thank my wife, Anna, who puts up with a lot of the agony of creation and doesn't get much of the credit. I think every science fiction writer dreams of the day that he or she will get this first Hugo. Somehow I always envisioned myself as about 87 years old at the time, walking with a cane and seeing iBot, and accepting an orbit at O'NeillCon 1. Thank you all for putting me 50 odd years ahead of schedule. Let's see if we can do the same for O'NeillCon 1. Thank you. We were intending to give out an award for best novel. There is a slight problem of cash flow. You may have noticed in the last 45 minutes or so that Craig Miller has been conspicuous by his absence. Last seen driving in the direction of Tijuana in a new Mercedes. The big model with the swimming pool in back. Accompanied by the fan guest of honor Richard Eney and his brothers, Meanie, Miney, and Moe. <laughs> but we passed the hat backstage and managed to get enough to squeeze in the best novel. So the candidates are Millennium by John Varley. Moretta, Dragon Lady of Pern. <laughs> the 
by Anne McCaffrey. The Robots of Dawn. By Isaac Asimov. Star Tide Rising. By David Brin. And Tea with the Black Dragon. By R.A. McAvoy. Star Tide Rising. I was told to say that. I don't know what it means. Uh, I, I would like to um, thank Stan Schmidt for buying the original novelette and for his uh, always very insightful advice. Tappan, uh, King, and Lou Aronica for guiding me through some rough times. My brother Dan, as usual, for being probably the best editor on the West Coast. Nobody knows about him. Uh, and all of you for causing me to experience what I haven't since the 60s. And that was on artificial substances. <laughs> now it looks like the awards are all gone. But before I put an end to this program, let me just say this. If I had my way, there would be two more awards that I would hand out tonight. The first, of course, and obviously, would go to the officers and members of the World Con Committee. Those of you who spent the weekend here know the sheer magnitude of the job that they performed, the thousands of man hours, woman hours, person hours, you name it, that have gone into this effort. They worked so hard and long to bring this convention to a reality. And I can't name them all. They're all in your program, Buford. But all of them deserve our gratitude for the job that they've done. And since we can't give them an award, let's give them our applause. My second award would go to you folks down there. It's true what they said when they pulled that switch on me, that in November I will have been a professional writer for 50 years and for almost 40 of them. I've had the pleasure of appearing and speaking at conventions. I don't know how much longer I'm going to have that privilege, but I do want you to know just how very much it is meant to me. I've never had a finer audience than this, and in the absence of an award to each and every one of you, my thanks. 